Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Taiwo Oriola. I'm from All Star Law School. The presentation will be looking at the uh, Criminal Justice Act of 2016, which um, criminalizes uh, revenge pornography in Northern Ireland. I'll be focusing on a key provision of the um, legislation, which is Section 51. Uh, section 51.1, Section 51.2, Section 51.3, and Section 51.4. Uh, I'll be looking at the defenses to, to revenge pornography as well, looking at the weaknesses uh, in the legislation, as well as looking at uh, possible civil remedies that uh, victims of revenge pornography uh, could access. So I'm going to start with... Uh, the definition of revenge pornography, which, as you are going to say, is quite different from the way it's conceptualized under the Criminal Justice Act of 2016, which, by the way, is based on the uh, Criminal Justice Act of 2015 from England and Wales. Now, revenge pornography, as a general de definition, is uh, a consensual or non-consensual creation of private sexual images and non-consensual distribution or disclosure of private sexual images. There is an intention for doing this, which is uh, to uh, exact a revenge or to uh, obtain sexual gratification. That there is an intention, there is a primary motive for it. That's why it's called revenge pornography. Uh, in popular media. But we are going to see, I want you to bear in mind that definition because this is quite different from what we have under the Criminal Justice Act of 2016, which is quite narrower in scope uh, than the general perception or conception of revenge pornography. Uh, some scholars are quite disagreeable as to whether we should properly describe this as revenge pornography, They're thinking that this is focusing more on the um, uh, the perpetrator rather than the victim of the crime. Uh, but at the same time, we have to be mindful of the, of the reason why somebody would disclose uh, sexual private images of, of, of a partner or a friend. Uh, it's usually because of revenge, to humiliate or to embarrass uh, the other party. Now, uh, like everything else, revenge pornography predates the internet. It's been around before the advent of the internet, which became mainstream uh, in the 1990s. But it's been exacerbated by, by the internet. There is no doubt about that. And also because of uh, sophisticated uh, digital mobile devices, uh, smartphones, for example, they are much more powerful today than the computers of the 1990s. And they are mobile, and they can take good images and good films as well. So all of these have facilitated the frequency of event pornography. Now, some scholars also believe that we should regard revenge pornography as a sex abuse. I, I think that's, that's also uh, correct, because it's a, in a way it is, it's a sexual abuse. Uh, but then it's also important to distinguish between revenge pornography and other forms of sexual uh, abuse. Now, revenge pornography is not a victimless crime. Uh, uh, victims do suffer psychologically. Uh, with, there's a recent research which demonstrated anxiety, depression, uh, suicidal thoughts, and associated problems amongst female victims. The, the research was focused on female victims, not on uh, male victims. So we can see clearly that it's, it's not a victimless crime. Uh, there's, there's always a price. Uh, to be paid. Now, I'm going to be looking at uh, the scope of the offenses. Now, this is very important because it allows us to see the weaknesses in the conceptualization and the definition of revenge pornography under the, uh, the Justice Act of 2016. Uh, Section 511AB defines it as an offense 
to disclose a private sexual photograph or film of an individual who appears in the photograph or film without their consent and with the intention of causing that individual distress. We can see clearly the language of the provision. First, it criminalizes this, the disclosure of the photograph or film which show sexual images. It doesn't say anything about the making of the photograph or film itself. Uh, and we are going to see how this matters when we look at other weaknesses as we go along. Okay? So, um, also, we also see the with intent to cause distress. So there must be an intention to cause distress. It's not enough to just disclose the private photograph or film. There must be the intention to cause distress. I think the, the problem here is the, the, um, the draft of this piece of legislation. They are anxious to get conviction because you have to prove the intent in a criminal offense the mental element of an offense, the mens rea. It's not enough to just demonstrate that an offense was committed. You have to prove that there is an intention to commit the offense. We are going to see how this is a major flaw uh, as we go along uh, with the discussion. Uh, now, another scope of the offense is uh, section 51.2. Now, it says that uh, it, is an it is not an offense to if the disclosure of private sexual photograph or film is made solely to the individual who appears in the photo or film. Now, this, this is a contradiction in itself if what you are trying to do is to prevent the threat to the, uh, to the victim of the uh, uh, revenge pornography. It shouldn't matter whether uh, the photograph or film is disclosed to a third party or to the person themselves you would agree that there are some people who would not want to see uh, their uh, intimate photos and films, even by themselves, not just by third parties. There's this gap in the law that doesn't say anything about whether or not uh, this would be an offense if this is disclosed to, to the victim himself or herself. Now, this is a, this is a serious gap in the law because um, it's, there's a presumption that the photo or the film uh, was made with consent. This is not always the case. Uh, it could be the case that the photo or the film was made without authorization. Okay? So, and now disclosing it to the person, the victim, would be a surprise. It could be an embarrassment as well. And I don't see why this is not a criminal offense under Section 51.2. Now, I'm going to move on quickly to the scope of the defenses. The first one is uh, what I would characterize as law enforcement exception. This is a very strange provision under Section 51.3 because it says that um, any person who reasonably believed that the disclosure was necessary for the purposes of preventing, detecting, or investigating a crime uh, would not be committing an offense. They would have a valid defense to any unauthorized disclosure of photograph or film showing sexual images. Now, it's quite understandable why this would be allowed for law enforcement. But then, of course, this is only going to aggravate the distress of the victim if law enforcement were allowed to do this, even though it is meant to uh, investigate crime, to detect crime, or to prevent the commission of crime. Another exception is section 514A and B. I will summarize this as a journalism exception. This is even more bizarre because it allows for journalists in any news reporting, provided they reasonably believe that it is in the public interest, they could actually disclose uh, sexual images uh, that was originally unauthorized, if this is in the public interest to do so. Again, uh, you can only imagine that this is going to aggravate the distress of the, of the victim. And uh, there might be a public policy why this is necessary, but it's, it might be very difficult to 
has had a situation where it will be in the public interest for journalists to disclose uh, sexually explicit images of him, of, of a victim. Now the third exception is under section 515AB, uh, deals, deals with uh, a third party, an innocent third party, who purchased a film or photograph, which is essentially a revenge pornography, without knowing that the original disclosure was unauthorized. Now, this, this will look to be okay uh, in the circumstances because uh, the person uh, reasonably believed that the original disclosure was authorized, so they bought it, they gave some consideration uh, for the material, so they should be able to hold on to it and it's not a criminal offense. Uh, now, the underlying policy for this section is meant to protect the pornographic market. Uh, the legal pornography market is worth uh, $97 billion globally. So how do we distinguish event pornographic material from legal pornographic material? So uh, the law is meant to protect, in my view, those who might accidentally purchase materials that were originally undisclosed with authorization. Uh, it would seem that this is the uh, only defense that could be justified in a way, you know. But even so, there should be some qualification to it, as I'm going to discuss uh, uh, later. Now, under Section 51C, six, we have burden of proof. The burden of proof is on the prosecution to uh, prove that the journalist, uh, the third party who purchased the material, or the law enforcement person who disclosed uh, in the public interest that uh, they were not able to satisfy the prosecution. They have to prove this beyond reasonable doubt, of course. So the burden of proof is on the prosecution as in all criminal cases. Now, sentencing under Section 51.9, uh, it's uh, up, upon conviction, uh, it's two years imprisonment or a fine or both. Now, if there's a summary conviction, in which case there is no trial, the accused pleaded guilty, then it comes down to six months imprisonment or a fine or both. Now, when we look at the enormity of the crime, you know, there's, there's a case to be made uh, for the fact that this is probably not enough uh, punishment uh, for the perpetrator, especially when we look at the motive for wanting to disclose private sexual images. Now, I'm going to just uh, flag up the weaknesses again. Uh, uh, section 51.1b and 8 uh, expressly requires uh, that the person charged with an offense must have the intention of causing that individual distress. It's not enough to disclose uh, private sexual images or film. There must be an intention to cause a distress. Now, the implication of this is that an accused person could still go scot-free, even though they actually disclose these private sexual images, as long as there is no intention to cause distress, even though the disclosure, the mere disclosure has already caused distress or is liable to cause distress or an embarrassment. I cannot conceive of any situation where anyone will not be embarrassed by the disclosure, public disclosure of their uh, intimate photograph or film. Okay, but the, the, the bar is raised higher for the prosecution in this case. They still have to prove that the accused person actually has the intention to cause an embarrassment or distress. And I think this is making the law weaker than it it's already is because it raises the bar for uh, prosecution and for proof of, of guilt. Uh, the next uh, weakness is the uh, the one under section 51 to which I mentioned uh, previously. Uh, it is not an offense if the disclosure of the private sexual photograph of him is made solely to the individual who appears in the film. Now, now this is uh, an anomaly in a way because 
Uh, it overlooks the possibility that the film or the photograph could have been made without the consent of the person who appears in the film or the photograph. Okay, so by not criminalizing the disclosure of the film or the photograph to the victim, this is a major gap in the law, uh, as, as I say it, because it sort of weakens it in a way. Uh, the accused person could get away with uh, surreptitious making of uh, pornographic material, disclosing it to the person in the film or the photograph without actually committing a criminal offense. That's the implication of Section 51.2. Now, another weakness is that of law enforcement exception, which I mentioned briefly before. Now, it's going to be very difficult to conceive a situation where it will be perfectly legal for any law enforcement uh, to disclose private sexual images in the course of preventing, investigating, or detecting a crime. I mean, this is going to just aggravate and exacerbates the uh, distress of the victim. There, there could be argument for this. Uh, but I don't believe the argument for it outweigh the uh, dignity and the sensitivity with which this material should be treated uh, uh, for the victim because it's talking about public policy, public interest. I don't see how this should outweigh the individual's uh, dignity. Another weakness, of course, is that of the journalism exception. Uh, this is talking about public interest exception, that uh, journalists, if they think that uh, it's the public interest to, to disclose this material, then this should be allowed, and it is not an offense to do so. Uh, again, it begs the question as to whether it could ever be in the public interest to disclose private sexual photographs or films in news reporting uh, I still can't conceive if, of, of a possibility where somebody will come and say it is in the public interest that we should see these images. Uh, I, I don't know why this is there in the law. Now, uh, I've highlighted this, the key weaknesses of the law. I'll quickly go to complementary civil remedies because uh, I'm aware of my time. Uh, there are various civil remedies that uh, could be available to the victims. Uh, because sometimes the criminal system may not be uh, able to uh, provide uh, uh, lasting uh, remedies, even though there is a successful prosecution. The first one is, is injunction, civil injunction. Uh, this has been applied widely across England and Wales and in Northern Ireland recently as well. Uh, when you are aware that someone is going to publish uh, a sexual image or film, you could go to court and apply for an injunction to prevent the publication or disclosure. So this provides an immediate remedy to possible lasting embarrassment. Uh, another possible uh, remedy in the law of tort is uh, misuse of personal or private information. Uh, the uh, victim could sue for damages uh, and uh, this is a good course of action that victims could pursue uh, in a civil court. Uh, another one which comes from Australia is breach of confidence. This was the first time ever that breach of confidentiality has been used to, uh, um, as a course of action in a revenge pornographic case, uh, the case of Wilson and Ferguson. Uh, the accused person uh, published on Facebook uh, sexually explicit images of, of himself and, and his former partner uh, as a revenge for the breakup, okay? And uh, she, she suffered distress, mental problems, she couldn't work. So the court awarded equitable damages. Uh, that was the, about $13,000. And also uh, general damages, of, which is about $35,000. For the distress, the embarrassment. Uh, so this is also a possible remedy that we pursue uh, here in Northern Ireland and as well as in England and Wales. Then we already have the Harassment Act of 1997, Section 31 and 32 allows for damages to be sought uh, by the uh, victim. Uh, another remedy is under data protection legislation. 
Uh, revenge pornography materials are personally identifiable information because they are going to depict the photos and, and, and the images of the person. And anybody who knows them will recognize them as such. So you could sue uh, under the data protection legislation for damages because this will be regarded as personally identifiable information under section 10, 13, and 14 of the Data Protection Act. Now, copyright legislation is another possible remedy uh, that the victim could pursue, but there are conditions for using copyright. Uh, photographs are regarded as artistic work under, the, under section 42 of the CDPA uh, 1988. Films are also pro protected under section 5B of the CDPA and, uh, but then you can also protect film as a dramatic work, but you have to meet the originality uh, requirements under section 3.1 of the CDPA. Uh, above all, you have to prove that you are the author of the photographic material or the film before you could sue for copyright infringement. Now, I'm going to look at the role of uh, social media operators as well as uh, technical solutions to, to revenge porn uh, as a complementary uh, system to the criminal uh, remedy. Now, social media operators, they are legally obliged to remove offensive content expeditiously, and they could be liable if they fail to do so, uh, or if the court found that they actively contribute to the content or to the promotion of the content. We've had a number of case law in this area. Uh, because of time, I will not be able to go deeper into that. Another possible remedy is technical solution, which is being tried in Australia as we speak. Facebook has rolled out a program which seeks voluntary donations of uh, intimate photographs and films. The intention is to create a big database uh, with Facebook. So if somebody submits your uh, photo or film which is sexually explicit, this will be tagged and it will be automatically blocked. Uh, it's been tried in Australia. We, we don't see, uh, we will see how this is going to uh, work out. Now, in conclusion, uh, the criminalization of event pornography in Northern Ireland is, is justified, is timely, but there are clear gaps in the existing law which actually weakens successful prosecution uh, of accused persons. But the good news is that uh, we have complementary civil remedies which the, accused, uh, the victims could pursue uh, in injunction, breach of confidence, uh, harassment act, misuse of private information, and copyright legislation. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.